Welcome to Maximizing Your Potential with pastor and teacher Timothy Miller of White Dove Church. White Dove Church is located in the heart of Lafayette at 1400 West University Avenue. Now let's join Pastor Timothy for another life-transforming word from God. So once again, the scripture that we've been dealing with for the last month is very popular, well-known in Habakkuk 2. We start in verse 1. It says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. And then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets. Write your impossibility list so you can believe God for what the Lord has shown you is in your future. That he may run who reads it. That he may have some hope and have some excitement because he has something to look forward to. Are y'all tracking? And then verse 3 says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come and it will not tarry. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word, God, and again, as we go into this message tonight, we ask that, God, you will bless our ears and our eyes, the Lord, that we'll be able to open up our minds and the spirit realm to hear what you are speaking to us, so that, God, we can move forward into what you have for us and be able to see spiritual vision before us, God, to be able to fulfill all that you have ordained for us specifically in this life, in Jesus' name. And everybody said. Amen. So look, <clears throat> we're looking at this, and again, Habakkuk, you know, he says what? He says, I'm going to do something, because he was a doer. And you got to understand that God is looking for some doers. It's a lot of people in the church that believe but not a lot of people in the church belong. Come on, bro. It's easy to believe, but do you belong? Because believers that become belongers become people that see things happen. Amen? And those are people that are doing something that they're not just coasting by through life. Amen? And so Habakkuk says, hey, I'm going to climb my tower because I'm going to put some feet to my faith. Because I want to see what God is saying to me right now. I don't want to wait till tomorrow. I don't want to, I'm not looking for a prophetic word. Because a prophetic word waits, it, it, just, it just takes too long. Are y'all here? I need something to happen. I need something to happen. And so I need to see what God is speaking to me. And I need to see it right now. Has anybody ever felt that way? So look. God is speaking a now word that when seen will reveal his vision and look at this, his ultimate intention for your life and for his church. So people ask me all the time, they say, Pastor, how do I know what God's will is for my life? What am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to be? How am I supposed to respond? You know, I want to be able to know where I fit in the body of Christ. Well, God has an ultimate intention for each and every one of us. But you have to be able to have your eyes open to spiritual vision so that you can be able to see what he is saying concerning you. And so that's what I've been spending these last four weeks dealing with all of this because I want us to be able to open up our eyes to see what our part is in the local church, what our part is in our, in our relationships, what our part is in, in, in business and in, in our working relationship, what our part is out there when we go into Walmart and the free markets and all those type of things. So you've got to be able to understand exactly what God's ultimate intention is for your life. And that's why tonight we're talking about God's ultimate intention. See, because most people develop their own self-image and self-worth based on the words and experiences that are validated. So that's why if somebody tells me, hey, you know what? You're stupid. You, you, you don't speak very well. Uh, you ugly. You too short. Uh, you too fat. If they tell me all of that, well, look, if I already have an inkling on the inside of me that I'm leaning towards that, 
then I'll be, begin to validate that and I'll begin to receive that. And then that's what I become more and more because I've made it validated. I've made it of substance in my life. But the minute that stuff begins to be spoken to me, if I begin to counter it with the word of God, if I begin to counter it according to who God says I am, not what the world says I am, then I'm validating the word of God and I'm not validating, look, I had a gateway experience. It was awful. A dog ran up and chewed my ear off. And now every time I see a dog, I want to go uh, run into a house somewhere and get a gun and, and, and get in the corner because I'm scared because I had a gateway experience. You know, no, what do you do if you get bit? By a dog, what's the greatest way to defeat that fear? The next time you see a dog, go up and pet it. Otherwise, that gateway experience will control you the rest of your life. Because then it tells you that all dogs are going to bite your ear off. You understand? Because that's how the mind works. You know, and so that's why I told you this once before is that growing up, I didn't do the theme park thing. You know, I went to a couple of things and I and, and I remember my brother was a lot older than me and he went and rode the raging cage in a Ponce train beach and, and he got real sick and he didn't have a good experience. So I made a decision. You know what? Well, he did that for me. I'm never doing that. And then I got older. Then my kids wanted to go ride at the theme park. And I was like, I'm good with that. Well, you know what? One day I decided to get on the rides with my kids. And now I ride them more than they do. Because what did I do? I got that gateway experience and I turned it around to the positive and created a new experience that I validated that this is not something I don't want to do. Now this is something I want to do that can be fun and beneficial. Are y'all with me? So look, without God's word activated, and this is so vital, that word activated, and I highlighted it on purpose, without God's word activated in your heart, your own estimation of yourself will be louder. When God's word is activated, it's the loudest voice. But unless you activate it, then your own estimation of, your, of yourself is going to limit the vision of God from coming to pass in your life. Because you'll always say you can't. You'll always say that you won't. You'll always say don't. You'll always say not. You'll always say everything that is anti-Christ speech. Anti-Christ speech is always things that go towards the negative of how it's impossible. But Christ's speech is everything that goes through the, the way of it can be done because all things are possible through him that believe. I can do all things through Christ that strengthen me. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm an overcomer. I, I'm, the, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm blessed coming in and blessed going out. So look, i got to understand that I've already won this race, that the race is fixed. We go a little further. One of my favorite scriptures, Ephesians 5.14. Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. We have a lot of people that are not physically dead, but they are spiritually dead, that they need to be awakened so that they can be able to walk out the purposes and the plans that God has for them. And so I'm just telling you that you have to begin to see not where you are. Yes, you... you you, you realize this is where I'm living and this is where I'm at, but you can also be able to see where you're headed so that you don't get stuck and marooned, you know. Look, that three-hour tour turned into something awful. <laughs> and so you got to understand that don't get to complacent where you just settle and get comfortable into a position because it seems right. If it had been me, I would have been done in that water talking about I'm going to get off this thing. I'm going to swim until I can't swim no more. I'm not staying out here with, uh, I'm not staying out here with Mary Ellen and, and, and all these people. I don't even know their names, but Thurston Howell and all those folks. I'm not staying out here. I'm not staying out here. I got to go because I got a vision. Are y'all here? Gilligan might have had his island, but God's got a vision for me. Are y'all here? And so look, vision is best explained as the act of imagining a reality that hasn't arrived yet. Now the best way I can describe this is little girls 
as they begin to get to that place in their life, they begin to think about their wedding day. And what do they do? They think about their dress, and they think about the, the guests, and they think about the cake, and they think about the groom, and they think about that moment, and they're standing at the aisle, and they're, and they're looking down uh, at, at this man, and he's looking at her, and, and the, the preacher's there, and, and, and the goo-goo eyes, and, they don't, and at that moment, they don't know who they are anymore. If you say, if it's Bill and Lucy, you say Bill, you say Lucy, no response. Because at the altar, they're brain dead. But what do they do? They dream. And they, they walk that altar, or they walk that aisle. Uh, that, that little girl, she walks that aisle a hundred times in her life. Because in her mind, she's thinking about it. And that, that guy, he thinks all those times of, of when she's coming. And she's coming towards him. And, and, and he's going to be married to her. And it's going to be wonderful. Right? And so that's a vision that they develop. And it's something they dream about. The first car that you're ever going to have. And you're going, I'm going to get my license. I'm going to get my license. I'm going to get my license. Then you get the license, and you're like, you got the license. And now it's like, I need my car. And then you get your car. And when you get your first car, you just look at the keys. And you just jingle them. But see, before you ever got your first car, you dreamed about it. You dreamed about yourself driving. You're driving down the Sonic, right? Or driving down, you know, doing your thing. Are y'all here? Why? Because you be whatever your thing is, whatever it is. If you're a musician, you know I'm a musician, and I remember thinking about my first uh, set of drums, and I was and, and 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 being able to play in my first concert, and and being able to do my first uh, recording, and all those different things. And I did all of those things, but I did them in my head before I ever did them for real. And so God wants you to understand that you have to develop a vision of where you want to go, and begin to live in it by imagining a reality that has not arrived yet, but he wants you to do it according to what he's calling you to do. Are y'all here? Yeah. See, the principle is that you have, you have got to see whatever you are hoping for by faith envisioned in your heart and in your mind before you can ever see it in your reality. You have to see it. It has to be real to you inside before it ever takes place. It has to. Okay, so look. If you believe in your heart that you're a failure and that you can't succeed, then ultimately what you are saying is that you don't deserve as a child of God to walk in His ultimate intention for you. You're basically saying, Oh God, you made a mistake. I don't deserve all the goodness that you want to bless me with. <laughs> I said, we know that that's not true, but the mind is a terrible thing because it plays tricks on us. See, the truth that you got to know is if you stay in your present place, all you're going to get is what you can see in the natural. If you stay in your present place, your position in life that you're in right now, all you're ever going to get is what you can see in the natural. The wrong mentality will stop you from reaching the proper place. So again, the questions come. What am I supposed to do in my life? Pastor, what's the will of God for me? What am I supposed to do? Look, I can't wave a magic wand over you and tell you what God's will is for you. I can't do that. I know you want me to, but I can't. You have to get a word from heaven. You have to go and see the vision of what God wants to do through you. And you have to see it first and then walk it out. I can't tell you my story. My story, look, I remember uh, uh, whenever uh, a famous preacher was, had all these people coming and they wanted ministry. And the guy told him, he says, this is what I want you to pray for me. What? I want you to pray for me that I could have a ministry just like yours. Well, the guy's got a ministry of like 40,000 plus, right? This is just a, uh, just a wet behind the ears no-yo who just tripped into the building, right? And he says, I want you to lay hands on me. I want to have a ministry like yours. He says, son, you don't want a ministry like I got. No, I want a ministry like you. Pray for me. I can have a, okay, you don't want a ministry like what I have. No, 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 no. Look, I'm telling you, lay your hands on, okay, come here. Lay his hands on him, Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray right now that you'll give him sleepless nights, that he'll feel afraid and have to hide under his bed 
uh, as, as, uh, uh, to be afraid that he's going to be beat. That God, that you're going to help him to know what it is to eat mayonnaise uh, sandwiches. And that to be happy that that's all. That, and he just, and look, the guy said, wait a minute. I don't want you to pray all that on me. <laughs> and the guy said, if you want a ministry like mine, that's what I had to do. That's where I came from. That's the walk I had to walk. And so what you have to understand is you can't get somebody else's revelation a vision for what God has given for them to do. You have to get a revelation of what the vision is for you. What I have had to do and what I'm doing daily, I live this thing. This is what God's called me to do. So if you're not called to the fivefold ministry, if you're called to be in the workforce, then your life is going to be different from mine, and you need to get what God's called for you to do so you can be able to accomplish the vision he has set for you. Are you all understanding that? Yeah. See, the problem is once you adopt the mentality that everybody else can, can and you can't, you never see what God is saying even though he's been saying it to you the entire time. Because you're so busy talking about, I can't, I won't, I'm not good enough. And the whole time God's talking to you and telling you how you're the apple of his eye and how he loves you and how, how special you are to him. But you don't hear that. All you get is white noise. Some of y'all don't know what that is. You know, when the TV goes, you know, and it's just, there's just nothing there, right? I mean, it's just getting to the point where, where I'm feeling older and older. <laughs> when I tell a joke and nobody gets it, I've realized I'm in another anointing now. It's okay. Sorry. It's, right. it's okay. Look at somebody and say, God's ultimate intention. So look, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. What that literally is teaching is that where there is no vision, people will perish and live their life cheaply because there is no motivation or focus to what they are doing. So it's like the assembly line. You know, the, the conveyor belt's coming and they just just doing their job. The next person's the next person's and the other person's over here like and they just do this all day long because why? Because they've got no direction, right? They don't know what to do. They don't know where they're headed. And they're just doing the same thing. The same thing. And what it is, this is insanity. Ex doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Guess what, sunshine? The conveyor belt's going to keep coming this way. And it's going to keep coming with stuff. And you're going to have to keep on doing what you got to do until you make a decision to get out the line and say, you know what? I'm getting out of this thing. And I'm going to break free because I'm a prisoner of my own demise. Come on. See, when you don't have a vision and a direction outside of your own needs being met, you immediately begin to lose the presence of God in your life. Because what is it? It's about food, fuel, clothes, shelter, uh, transportation, uh, going to an event, doing this, going there. It's never about worshiping the Lord because all you're worried about is the next thing you need. The, the way you can be fulfilled. And God's like, if you can just understand Matthew 6.33, if you can just understand that, then you'd know that you don't have to worry about your needs being met if you'll just seek me. Seek the kingdom. Walk in righteousness. I'll take care of the rest. But we get so uh, logical and reason everything out to where we understand, oh, wait a minute. <coughs> I got $100. And I'm supposed to give God 10 because I'm supposed to tithe. And so $10, so that leaves me $90. But I got $150 worth of bills. So I can't afford to tithe. Well, you can't afford to pay your bills either. So why would you rob God and you can't pay your bills anyway? Pay your tithe and watch God supernaturally come up with the money that you lose, that you, that you don't have. Rob God and watch yourself lose everything and can't pay anything and get no grace or mercy from anybody. 
Ask me how I know. Look, I'm telling you, I've been doing this a long, long, long time. And my wife and I, when we first got together, we were so poor, we were so bad off, that people on the street begging for money would give us money. <laughs> See, look. The good news is that God has an ultimate intention or a vision for every person's life. It's God's heart for you to be blessed in all that you put your hands to. So you got to understand, you have to trust the Lord, and you have to trust the Lord with your finances. And, and, and whenever we were young, you know, and, 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 and we were working two jobs, I was working all night long uh, uh, doing grocery uh, stocking groceries and my wife was working all night long as a nurse's aide at the nursing home and then we'd go home we'd work 11 o'clock at night 7 o'clock in the morning we'd go home we had one car between us and uh, so I'd drop her off pick her up we'd go home to our little apartment and then uh, I'd, I'd go back to work at 11 o'clock that morning uh, uh, at a restaurant and work from 11 to 2 o'clock and then I'd go home for a few hours until that night, 11 o'clock, and start all over again. That's what we did when we first got married. And we did all of that and still didn't have anything. But we always paid our tithe. And somehow we got from there to 26 years ago to here. And that somehow is because of the faithfulness of God. You got to understand that, okay? See, because God had an ultimate intention for us. And it's God's intention for you to be healthy, happy, and holy. For your kids not to be crazy or to drive you crazy. For you and your spouse to have a happy home and not to have a war zone for a home. For your money to stop acting funny and for you to stop acting funny with your money. And for you to be blessed and not stressed. Somebody said amen. amen. See, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are good plans, plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. So look, God uh, did not wait until you showed up to create a purpose for your arrival. Oh, well, so-and-so is born, so let me see what am I going to do with so-and-so. You know, uh, I mean... I got to figure something out because, I mean, you know, I'm so busy all over the world. God doesn't do that. God had a vision and a purpose for you. He was there, Psalm 139, in, your, in the mother's womb. He was a part of, of everything that you are, the reason that you can do what you can do, the abilities that you have, everything you are. God was there, and it was on purpose. Uh, if you can sing, it was on purpose. If you can't sing, it was on purpose. Okay, if you're if you're able to be good with math, if you're not able or whatever your gifting is, God was there and it was for his glory that he created you exactly. You have been created perfect for your purpose. God had a vision and a purpose for you that he established in heaven and then sent you as the answer in the form of your arrival. Do you get that? And so it's important for you to know that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance and they are irrevocable. No matter what you think or what others think about you, God's ultimate intention for your life will stand. So they can, they can name call you. They can talk about you. They can lie about you. They can, they can do whatever they want, send rumors around about you. They can put an ugly post about you on Facebook and leave your name out, but you know they're talking about you. Yeah, I know about that. People do that. And they, they think that we're stupid. But they also think that we care. <laughs> Because you see, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very good at unfollow and delete. And it only takes once for me to unfollow or delete an individual. Now, for the slow learners, that means I don't ever see anything they say ever again. And that works for me, okay? Because I'm not coming off my throne to argue with a fool. I'm just not going to do it. I see people on Facebook all the time, and they get these long feeds where they're arguing about all this stuff. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't understand it. 
Because at the end, nobody wins. At the end, nobody wins, and the church looks foolish. And so I just decided I've got to stay. Because, you know, even my wife, she's always telling me, baby, get, get away from the keyboard. Because, like, with the political stuff, people start the political stuff, and I want to get on there. And she says, you can't do it. And I said, I know, but I want to. I want to say my say. I need to say it. Because these people are stupid. And no, no. You can't help them. Because stupid can't be fixed. And so I just back up. I said, you're right, baby. Stupid can't be fixed. So I'm going to leave them alone. <laughs> We're talking about God's ultimate intention. And in Genesis, one of my favorite portions, uh, this, uh, I love this story. Genesis 13, uh, 14 and 15. After Lot was gone, the Lord said to Abram, look as far as you can see in every direction. For I'm going to give it all to you and your descendants. Now what's important to see is this is Abram who becomes Abraham, who, is, who becomes the father of blessing, whom Galatians talks about when the curse was reversed through Jesus and refers back to the father of blessing, that there was almost like a, a blockage, and that blockage was removed and opened up, that we could be able to receive the fullness of the blessing. And watch this right here. He says, I'm going to give it all to you and your descendants, that we could be under the father of, of, uh, of blessing, Abraham, to receive all blessing to us. Why don't we own more property? Why don't we own more, uh, more, more land? Why don't we have more affluence? Why aren't we doing more? I believe that we struggle with really believing who we are and whose we are. We do well to know that we're saved. We do well to pray in our prayer language. We do well to make it to church upright. We do well to do all those type of things. But then if we can get beyond all of that and be able to make it through a week with encouragement, seven days a week where we have a smile and we have the joy of the Lord, then the next level has to be that we're able to walk into the blessings of Abraham. Amen? Amen? I just believe that. And so look... Seeing with spiritual vision is the result of making the choice to look past the natural and to look farther uh, than the natural eye can actually see. You have to go past what the natural eye is seeing and open your eyes to see what's in the spirit that you can't see because you're so focused in the natural. Because it's easy to see what's in the natural but if you stop looking at the natural and start opening your eyes past the natural, there's something in the spirit God wants you to see. Amen? See, whatever you see, you can have. But you must change the direction in which you are looking. That's why God told Abram, he says, look up into the heavens. But he was telling him, look, he said, I want you to have some spiritual vision. Look at the stars. Can you count them? Ask your descendants. Look at the sand on that beach. Can you count the grains of sand? Guess what? That's your descendants. Wow. That's the blessing that flowed through this man and that blessing of multiplication in every aspect of your life can be yours today. And all you have to do is receive it. It never fails in my household. Look, I drive a white Journey SUV, all right? Understand? Now look, that's what I drive. Now, I, nobody can, can blame me for, for excess, you know, excess, you know. I drive a white SUV. I, I drive a white SUV with a car seat in the back, <laughs> all right? All right? I am a dad and a granddad, all right? That's what I do. And so I drive it. I'm blessed with it. I live in a, in a nice home. I'm blessed with it. You know, uh, everything I have, uh, it's what we need, all right? So we don't have excess, but we have everything we need, and it is our heart's desire. We live Ephesians 3.20. We are living in the midst of, of we're living the dream. But you can tell, I can tell you, when I lift my right hand and I say, Lord, and I begin to pray, within six months it takes place. Now, I'm not bragging. I'm telling you that it works. Because I believe I'm the seed of Abraham. And I believe that I'm not only the seed of Abraham, but I believe I'm the Abraham of my family. And that that blessing flows into my children. It flows into all my children. Now, of course, I've got the two daughters. And I've got uh, my son. 
and I've got my son-in-law, and I believe my son-in-law is my son by the faith that he, that, that he receives the same anointing into his household, and he's a true son. And then it goes into all my other children and into my grandchildren, all the way down into Jonah and Juliet, who will be here in October. Yeah. And so I want my children and my grandchildren to never know the lack of faith I grew up with. I want my children and my grandchildren to know that they can have anything they, they want or desire, uh, lacking nothing, believing by faith according to his word, that, that it, they could be blessed. That's what we ought to be teaching our children. We don't need to be teaching our children how awful it is and how terrible it is because they don't need to hear all of that. We can prepare them, but let's, let's not protect them uh, with uh, giving them fear. Let's protect them by enabling them with the power of the name of Jesus and the authority of, of the believer and be able to walk as the seed of Abraham and be able to be blessed uh, in all that they do. That's how we're going to be able to help our kids the most. Amen? I'm not sure you're convinced, but it's okay. I know I'm right. So, Ezekiel 37 says in verse 1, uh, that the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out into the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the, in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And then he said he, he, that he caused me to, to pass all around them, and behold, there were very many human bones in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to the bones. Say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will make breath enter you so that you may come to life. Now look, what does this teach us? And we've preached this before, but let's look at it from a different way. The God that we serve is above natural limitations. So natural limitations will tell me I'm looking at some bones. I can't tell them bones to get up because they're dead. But look. God is above the circumstances and he's above any roadblocks that might come in your life that might try to come your way to throw you off of where the Lord's trying to take you. Which means, yeah, they dead, but God is bigger than those, those dead bones. And when he speaks, those dead bones have to live again. Are y'all tracking? So the spirit of God isn't affected by what things might look like in the physical realm, but instead he affects things in the physical realm by way of his ultimate intention, which is where you come in because when you step into a place, you bring with you something that wasn't in that place until you stepped into it. Amen. You and I have the ability to change the atmosphere, the climate of any place, any restaurant, any home gathering, any place we go if we carry authority with us. See, because I, I get together with folks, I have the authority of Christ. I'm not going to allow anything to deter me from the authority I have in Christ. I'm going to have the full armor of God on. I'm not going to, look, if I feel any, any kind of tingle, you know, I look at my wife, she looks at me, she knows. We're leaving. It's over. Because I'm not going to sit there and allow the enemy to ambush me. You have to get that. We're dealing with God's ultimate intention. Y'all all right? Y'all give me a few more minutes. See, if a person wants to walk with spiritual vision successfully and live out God's ultimate intention for their life, then they need to have a few things in operation. I'm going to give you four quick things, and then we're going to pray. Number one, God must be your ultimate authority. Now, look, this is basic, but sometimes we need to be told this type of thing. God must be your ultimate authority. Why, why, why is this important? The Bible tells us in Psalm 46, 10, and 11 that we should be silent and know that I am God, that I will be honored by every nation, that I will be honored throughout the world, and that the Lord Almighty is here among us, the God of Israel is our fortress. So look, 
God must be the ultimate authority in your life. God's ultimate intention will only work if we are willing to stop our plans, our agendas, understanding that we can only be successful in life if we are connected with God and connected with his authority. It doesn't matter how many plans you have, what your agenda might be, what you think you're supposed to do. And look, it could be that you say, well, I'm called to do this and, and I'm meant to do that. And that's all wonderful. And that's where the most trouble happens is that when folks start talking about what they're supposed to do for the Lord. But the real question is, have you submitted that to the Lord? Have you submitted it to the Lord? Because there's the birth of the vision. Okay? And there's the death of the vision. And then there's the resurrection of the vision. And God will test you. And God will test you because you'll get the vision and you're ready to get out there and plow. And then the Lord will come and say, well, okay, is this vision more important to you than me? Because I want you to put it on the shelf. Wait a minute, Lord. I'm gifted. I'm supposed to put it on the shelf. And then when you say, okay, Lord, not, not my will. And then, you, and then it dies. And then the Lord says, here. Because now I know I'm first. That's good. And he needs to know he's first because Lucifer bailed out on him. Adam and Eve bailed out on him. He dealt with the problems of men to where uh, Noah had to build a boat. He dealt with Moses uh, having to, to deal with the children of Israel where he had to let them die off. So he knows that men are foolish. And so because he understands how our commitment level can be questionable, he comes to us and he says, listen, I want to give you a vision but I want to make sure I stay first. So God must be the ultimate authority in our life. Number two is listening for the voice of God. Okay, we're trying to make sure that we're able to function in what God's ultimate intention is for us so that we can walk in spiritual vision, so that we can be able to... Uh, maximize our potential, that divine potential the Lord has just for us. And so as we are the answer to what God has purposed in this world specifically for us, that when we arrived, we were the answer. God says, listen, you have to be able to listen for my voice. And when we look at the scripture in Isaiah 50, 4 and 5, it says that the sovereign Lord has given me his words of wisdom so that I know what to say to all these weary ones. Morning by morning, he wakens me and opens my understanding to his will. Well, how does he open my understanding to his will? Because he speaks to me and I'm listening. Okay? The sovereign Lord has spoken to me and I have listened. I do not rebel or turn away. And that's why I was telling somebody earlier, when you hear that small voice, you always trust that small voice. I do it when I'm driving on the interstate. I'm driving on the interstate, and I come up on, a, on, a, on, on an exit, and I feel this inkling in me, I'm supposed to take the exit. And I'm like, I don't need to take the exit. And I get right up on the exit, and I just jump off. I say, okay, Lord, why did I take this exit? And see, I don't ever know if there's a horrible accident or there's something being prevented. And you'll never know, but you have to be able to trust the Lord because I'd rather trust that small little voice than shut it off and then I can't hear anything that he's speaking to me. And it's and it served me very well because we've heard of things. Well, this took place at such and such a time, and we were stuck in traffic. And had we been able to get to where the point where we wanted to be, we would have been in the middle of all that. And I might not be here tonight telling the story. So you have to trust that you can listen to the voice. Amen. See, Ezekiel listened to God's voice and raised a mighty army. The principle is God can only speak to you. 
if you are listening. And that's why you need to silence every other voice. Whenever you get an opportunity, you silence those voices and you get along with the Lord and you let him talk to you and you get, you, you get the game plan that the Lord has for your life. What I do here on Sundays and on Wednesdays, Sundays I speak corporately to the corporate body. I speak in such a way to where whosoever wills come in here. On Wednesdays I speak to the family of God. I have different anointings of how I flow. I speak more family oriented on Wednesday because if you come back on Wednesday, then I know you belong to me because if you come here on a Wednesday night, amen? But on Sunday, <clears throat> I speak to a corporate who, whosoever will body of believers. And so I speak in a different way uh, depending on who's here so that I can be able to minister. Uh, and it's those that are listening, amen? So I speak to those that are listening. But the only way that I can make an impact is if you're actually listening. Okay, but that's on that, on that level, the corporate level. But when you are home alone with the Lord, that's individual where he's speaking to you about you. I'm speaking to you about us. He's going to speak to you about you. You get it? Amen. And that's the difference. And so we have to, we have to know that because church is not enough to get us through. See, we need to learn how to shut off our own way of thinking long enough to pick up on what God is trying to say to us. The point to remember is that you have to watch to see what he is saying in the moment that he is saying it because the vision comes for an appointed time. And if you're not tuned in, you might miss it. I say, I know people personally, <coughs> excuse me, I know people personally called of God, supposed to be in the ministry, and they missed it. Because the appointed time came and went, and they weren't listening. And it's sad. It breaks my heart. Because whenever you see them, and they, they're driving a UPS truck, or they're working at a casino, or, they, or they're doing whatever they're doing, and there's nothing wrong with having a secular job, but whenever you missed what God had called you to do because you weren't listening. And you're never going to be fulfilled like you would have been fulfilled the rest of your life. You go through life and there's always this thing you're like, what's missing? It's because you weren't listening. And it's awful because they can't get it back. Those particular people. And so it's important that you don't miss the appointed time of what God is speaking to you because you're not listening. Amen? Now look, there's other blessings, there's other giftings, there's other anointings, but once you miss that one, that moment left you. So you have to wait for it almost like when, you know, the orbit and they come around so many years, the different planets and stars and, and all that stuff. I don't know but nothing about all that. I just know it happens every now and again. It's the same thing. You have to wait for that opportunity, which means you have to be listening. Don't get yourself in a position where you're waiting because you missed one. Amen? All right. Number three is the willingness to change. And this is tough because we like being who we are. And we like being who we are in such a powerful way that we're going to make sure everybody knows how much we like being who we are. And if you try to tell us anything, we show you who we are. We show you who we really are. We take the mask off and we show you. Amen? But we have to be willing to change if we want to be able to walk in God's ultimate intention for our life. 2 uh, Corinthians 3.18 says, We who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being what? Transformed into His likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So we are being transformed, which means you don't bring, and I've said this before, you don't bring your dysfunctional self into the kingdom. You come into the kingdom like you are, dysfunctional, but you don't stay that way. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to transform you into his likeness, not into your dysfunctional self. Come on. You, have to be, you have to come out of that, you know. And people like to parade 
You know, it's like stupid on parade. People like to just, you know, well, you know, I'm just the way I am. And the Lord loves me just the way I am. And I've been saved 25 years. Well, you know what? You need to change. Because that may have worked for the first couple of months. But, you know, all of this buy a flower, you know, fly around, uh, you know, hippie Christianity. I can't stand that stuff. You have to get in the word and get some discipline and get some order in your life. So you can be effective for the kingdom. Because God desires to take you to a new place in your walk with him. Where you don't tell the same story. Where all you have is, I was addicted. And, 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 and that's all you could ever say, you know. You have to have more than that. You have to be able to do more than that. Arthur goes into jail. He doesn't tell the same story. He teaches the kingdom keys. They already know his story. That's why he's in there. So now that he got past that, he don't have to do that every time. He may reference it now and again, but he can put discipleship into those men or in any of them that come out. Why? Because there has to be more than. You have to go to the next level. You can't live on that revelation forever. You have to stretch yourself. Amen? And so you go to a new place because the old place, you might get two or three people, but there's 20 over there that you're never going to touch until you go to your new place. Right. Right. Ezekiel had to change to have the victory that he had to go into battle with an army of people that were dead and now uh, alive was different for Ezekiel. Man, that was different for everybody. But could you imagine Getting ready to go into battle? In this day and age, the Lord comes to you. Doug, I'm ready for you to go win a battle for me. Go to the graveyard. I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> so here's Doug at the graveyard, standing by himself. The graves start cracking open. All he sees is skeletons everywhere. God, what now? Breathe life into those bones. And then an army comes out of the graveyard and Doug and this army do a great thing for the Lord. Guess what? That's what happened with Ezekiel. As crazy as it sounds, that's what happened. And it had never happened before, but he had to change the way that he thought about life and about battle and about faith Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to do what God wanted him to do. Y'all see that? I'm coming into a close. Ezekiel changed his viewpoint and as a result saw victory. If you like the way things are in your life right now, then God can't help you. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just telling you, if you like the way things are in your life, God cannot help you. Nor will he help you. He will just love you. But he can't help you because you've made a decision. This is it. I've gone two steps. I don't want to go a third step. I'm staying right here. You go somewhere with a five-year-old and it's hot and, 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 and the humidity's strong and, and they haven't had lunch yet. You're going to get to a point where that child's not moving anymore until they get some food and some air conditioning. And there's not a military in the world that's going to move that child. I know this from experience. So you got to understand that, look, if you, don't, if you just like it, that's just the way it is. See, God can bring you into a fresh vision, but first you have to see it envisioned in your heart and in your mind before you can ever see it in your reality. And the only way to see it is if you're first willing to change. So we're talking again about God's ultimate intention. Last point is evaluating your foundation. Because, I mean, if we're going to walk in God's ultimate uh, intention that he has for us and be able to see spiritual vision and to get past the natural, you've got to evaluate what your foundation is. You have to be able to sit there with a notebook and a pencil and write down 
what you believe and why you believe it and, and, and why you do what you do and why you didn't do that and why you did that over there and, and what made you and what, what was that thought about and, you know, and, all, and why'd you react and you, why didn't you react? You have to evaluate your foundation. And this is why. In Jeremiah 17, 8, they are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they go right on producing delicious fruit. Now why is this? Look, roots symbolize where your foundation comes from and the roots of the tree symbolize character. See, you can't see the roots of a tree because they're underground and out of sight. Which, of course... Like the roots of a tree, many times our character is also hidden out of sight somewhere underground. Sometimes that's a positive thing and sometimes not so positive. But God wants to build our character, those that call ourselves sons and daughters of God. And this is why you must evaluate your foundation because if your roots are holy, then the branches will also be holy. But if you're doing foolishness and shenanigans and God's, godless uh, chatter is coming out of your mouth, then you need to check your roots. Amen. You need to check your root system and see what's going on because there's something wrong somewhere if what's coming out of you is not lining up with what God's word says. See, once you see God's ultimate intention, you now have to use whatever you possess and put it in line with the revelation that you've received so that your circumstances then can begin to change. You will never get anything from God just sitting. You need to get up and do something with whatever the Lord has given you. And this is so vital because look, I'm telling you, you got to do something. You know, you got you to you pick up the jawbone of an ass, get in the water, you know, pick up some mud and put it in your eye. Uh, do something. You, miracles will work. God don't drop a miracle on you. Sovereignty comes from heaven where he'll just drop a, a sovereign move on a folk. But uh, miracles will work. And, and, and you got to believe God for a miracle where you say, well, uh, I'm financially uh, frozen. I'm in debt. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, if it's, not, uh, if it's not your harvest, then it's your seed. Come on. Try him and see. Because if it's not your... Look, if, it's like, if, if you got $150 worth of bills and only $90, well, then it's not your harvest. It's your seed. Watch, watch it now, I'm telling you, because he'll prove it. He'll prove it. Look, I, 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 I sat in a situation where we wrote a check... And we knew. That's it. There's nothing after that. And supernatural. God just proved himself over and again and again and again. I told you one time I received a check. And I was so happy to get it, but it wasn't a lot. And then the next day I got the same check again. And I called and I said, y'all must have made a mistake. Because you printed two identical checks and they said, no, just enjoy it. And I said, well, okay. And I was faithful. I was giving my tithe off. Of, I was on unemployment, and I was tithing off of unemployment. If you know anything about unemployment, once you tithe off of unemployment, <laughs> so the Lord did some, I mean, look, I was getting like, $200 of unemployment and so then this $900 check out of nowhere comes in my mailbox and the very next day another $900 check comes in my mailbox. So $1,800 in two days and I was just being faithful and God took care of me from an unexpected source. I'm, look, I live this. I'm, this is not just what we preach here. We live it. Okay? And so you have to know that God can do anything in, for him to do anything. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says that there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. 
There's a time and a season for every purpose and for everything to be accomplished. And every prophetic word has a moment of fulfillment. And I wanted to put this here to encourage you that, well, the Lord spoke to me back in 1982. Well, look, you got to hold on to that prophetic word. Because if you don't, if you lose faith, believe it or not, when you lose faith, you, 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 you stop the clock. That's what you're talking about. Look, God's not going to deal with your unbelief. You have to get that unbelief corrected and come into, into, into proper belief with him so that he can receive some glory. So you have to be able to begin to believe that that prophetic word is coming. It's coming. It just may not come when you want it to come, but it's coming. See, there is a fruit for every season, and until you produce the fruit for the season that you're in, you got to stay in that season. Yeah, but I want to produce fruit in that season because it looks wonderful over there. No, you still right here. So you can't go over there until you produce some fruit here. Because everybody's always got a better idea of, 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 of how, you know, in the corporate world, well, you know, if I was the boss, uh, this place would be, well, I'll tell you what, we, this business would be top notch. Well, you can't even sweep the damn floor. <laughs> how about if you do what you're supposed to do in your entry level job before you talk bad about the boss? And it's the same way in the kingdom. You have to produce the fruit in the season that you're in before you think you're going to be elevated to another. God's not going to take you somewhere and you, you're not even, oh, I want, to be in the, I, I want to be in the ministry. I want to be in the ministry. You come to church once a month. How can you be in the ministry? Fruit doesn't appear, but rather fruit has to grow. So you have to what? You plant it, you water it, you see about it, you know, you're there, you're taking care of it, you're being faithful, okay? You don't just show up when it's time to shine. Amen? See, you can't be a millionaire until you first learn how to balance your checkbook. Folks talking about, God, make me a millionaire. God, make me a millionaire. And your checkbook is $39.26 in the red. God is not going to make you a millionaire until you can be faithful in the little things. God has a process that brings all of his purposes to pass called time. So you have to be able to understand that in the process of some time that you have to do what? You have to be processed. And in that processing, uh, that, that you're going to go through that process to where you can be able to be faithful in the small things, then he'll make you ruler over many. But he's not going to make you ruler. You're not gonna, how, how can he give you a million dollars if you're in debt now? Because you're going to lose the million and still be in debt. Amen? So what we got to do is we got to work according to the level that we're in, make, uh, make that season to our best ability that we can take, see the fruit uh, remain in the season we're in, then we'll go to the next level. 